Matty, we recorded. Matty Evans, welcome to the, welcome to the H Hour Studio, mate. You are the one, two. You're the, you're the third. I say member of Heroic Hearts UK. You in the studio? You were going to be the f- sixth, but I had to p- postpone a, uh, uh, an interview with um, uh, Doctor Ruffle. Ruffle. Oh yeah, I, I, I haven't met a lot of the team at Ruffles. the moment. I've only yeah. just become part of the team. So welcome, so. welcome. Yeah, thank you. Excellent. Yeah. Um, Thanks for having us. Yeah, obviously Keith was uh, Keith was first on, and then we had Doctor Grace Bless Hartley, and okay. then yourself. Um, and anyway, off on a tangent, just one on the subject of uh, the old fruit tea because you you were saying off air, you ju- you just you've just finished or just finishing off your diet. I've just finished off a post dieta. So, right. for listeners, viewers, explain what a post dieta is. Post dieta, yeah. Dieta. Well, a dieta. Oh, so you on, you, on. you do a dieta, which I was stayed in a tambo, which is like a little shed with um, a bed in it uh, and a hammock, which was quite nice. Um, and you, the tambos are in the jungle in Peru, and you stayed in a tambo for eight nights, and you kind of I was. I did a dieta on a, a tree called Uchi Sanango. Right, so a dieta is a what a um, spiritual experience, psychedelic. Experience. Yeah, it's it's like um, the the dietas. You can drink um, ayahuasca or not, but this this plant that I used was a master plant, and on the master plants, you can, so on some of them you can't drink ayahuasca because the plants are too strong. So I had to dig up a plant, a tree. And I had to cut the roots off, and then I prepared the roots every morning. Um, and then you drink this, uh, you drink it back. The Uchi Sanango is good for clarity, and it's good for resetting your nervous system. Is the Uchi Sanango this tree? Yes, that's Got the it. tree. It's so you dig up the tree, prepare the roots every morning, and you need to drink it every day? You drink it every morning, yeah, for seven mornings. What's the what's the what's the effect on you, like well, medically, it, Psych, uh, psychologically? Um, you don't. It's not psychoactive, oh. so yeah. So it's not psychoactive. I've done <coughs> dietas before where I've drank ayahuasca on them as well, but this this dieta you um, you don't drink ayahuasca on it because it's too strong. But it re- it's reset my nervous system. Um, it's giving me clarity, so it's showing things in my life because it will take a. It's like a tree, you know. You'll it will grow. And you connect to the spirit of it. And the dieta is like a spiritual cleanse. And what you'll find in um, in the indigenous cultures, the shamans will they'll go and do like hundred dietas. Some of them will go off into the jungle and stay in the jungle for a, you know sometimes years at a time, um, just living on basic food. So you get a lot of restrictions. There's a lot of stuff that you can't eat. Um, for what reason? Just because you're trying to cleanse your cleanse your body. And then obviously connect to your spirit and connect to the spirit of the plant or the tree that you're using. Um, remind me what you called the the shed. What did you call it's it? It's a tambo. A tambo. So when you're in the when you're in the tambo, then so what is your diet while you're in there? So you get they bring your food to you and you get, you get they they being the shaman. Uh, the shaman or or the staff who are working underneath the shaman. So I was there's there's different ways you can do it. If you do it a traditional way, um, you'll get like oats in the morning so you get some porridge and you might get a couple of eggs and then you'll get a uh, rice and plantain and then you get a thing called fermented yucca sorry what's plantain plantain is like a boiled banana oh so it takes all the sugar out of it because you're not allowed sugar while you're on that diet um and then you get a uh, the thing called fermented yucca which is very nutritious but tastes of cardboard or nothing kind of thing and you you mix that so you get hot water so you get a flask of hot water a day you pour a bit of hot water into this yucca and you'll stir the yucca and then it's kind of creates this food um but you can live on you can live off that so that's that's your diet for the for the week some 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 of these diet dietas are will people do 30 days some will do six months depending on the kind of cleanse you need. So I did the last one I did, I did it eight days and then about eight nights. And then when you finish your dieta, you have a post dieta where you're not allowed to still eat any sugar, uh, limited oils, no spicy food. My dieta was not allowed any fruit. 
and then you're not allowed lot you're not allowed to have sex um you're not allowed to watch things that are, are, are very violent or anything that can contaminate you so change your spirit around so it's quite a clear it's quite a clean it's a very clean way of living so it gets rid of a lot of your habits your addictions if you've got any um and it just resets everything so you start again um, how do you <coughs> how do you go about the process of selecting which dieta you want to do? That's up to the shaman. So, ah. the, so, the, so whoever you're working with or you're training under, they'll they'll select the diet they think you need. So, the first dieta I did was on a plant called Aya Humor, which is a grounding plant, and it works on your ego a bit. Um, so, I did that last year, uh, and then the second plant I worked on was called Bobin Sanya. And Bob and Sanya is like a heart opening plant. Um, and I, it works on your emotions. It works on your emotions. So it ta- attaches you to your body a little bit. Um, it can kind of work on the inner child a little bit. Um, Go on, what do you mean by that? So we've all got an inner child. And sometimes as adults, the inner child can kind of be dominant in your personality. So it stops you from getting things done sometimes. Um, and, and some some people's personalities, because they're dominated by their inner child, they they're at, they act like children when they're adults. So it it's, can be hard to get things done. Um, I don't think Keith will mind me saying, but Keith did a dieta when I was doing my last dieta, and he he used Bob and Sanna. So he was uh, trying to connect to his heart, open his heart up. Hmm. Right. We're gonna come back to this. Yeah. Right. But. Uh, how did you? How did Matty end up going from where you were as a kid to now being <laughs> now being now being uh, a uh, you know a member of Heroic Hearts? Completely. I mean, you were I'm you were not the same person. I mean, we talked about it briefly on on the icebreaker just now, but even just three years ago, you're a completely different person to who you were three years ago, right? Yeah. Where did it go before? Is that was that when you so a big motorbike accident, right? Was that when you first discovered, I mean, ignoring the, not ignoring it, but the let's let's park the um, plant-based medicine thing for a minute. But was that when you first looked at anything to do with well-being, mindfulness, or did it come before that? No, it came before that. So um, I think <clears throat> I've worked in a gym for the last kind of 15, 20 years. Um, when I was younger, I fight it. I Fighting, yeah, I was I was on one of the first mixed martial arts shows in the UK a long time ago. What was that? Um, it was it was called Night of the Samurai. Okay. So yeah, I think there's a couple of fights of mine uh, on YouTube, but we were still fighting in rings in them days. The cages weren't up, and obviously now it's gone massive. But I think because I did martial arts, I was my martial arts instructor. He always kind of kept us in touch with that that kind of spiritual side a little bit. So the, the, the seed was planted a long time ago, but then I kind of forgot all about that. When you're working in a gym with boxers and mixed martial artists, there's a there's a lot of ego. Um, so, but the, the well-being, you know, you work in a gym, you train, you train hard, you eat well, you know, but a lot of people party as well. So a lot of fighters, even today, they, they train hard, you know, work hard, but party hard as well. Um, so I was kind of always aware of having a good diet, but my, I took it the other way, like, like most people do. You know, the extreme training, you train hard, but then you, you end up training hard for like uh, forever, you know, and, and then your body breaks, you know. So luckily enough, well, say lucky, um, I think the universe was t- telling me to slow down with my training. Uh, I've had quite a few injuries over the years, um, done some stupid, stupid things in training. Just, I, I remember I had, I, I did my ACL and I'd got my ACL fixed, but they didn't fix my meniscus. And because I just got back into training, my knee, and when I was grappling with the guys I trained with, every now and then my knee would pop out and I'd just straighten it in, straighten my leg up, it would, my knee would pop back in and then I'd carry on training. <laughs> And I used to think it was like a good thing and, and it was so stupid. <laughs> yeah, what an idiot. But um yeah, at the time you'd kind of got that mentality where you don't want to stop, you know, and that's what 
you know, guys who've been in the services and stuff, some of the injuries they've had and that kind of you built up that you build up that mentality to make it strong, you know, and, and I liken it to you know, we forge that sword. You want to make that steel hard. So you put that forge in the sword. But there's an art to that because if you keep the if you keep the sword in the forge for too long, you know, the metal the metal bends. And that's what a lot of guys do, you know, especially in the, the martial arts world and, and the fighting world. And it's, you know, you train really, really hard and then you keep on training really, really hard, you know, and, and you don't listen to your body because your mind's so strong. You think you're a quitter if you stop your training or you're not training so hard. So for me, there's a point where you've got to get to a point where you've got to accept that you're getting a little bit older, you've trained hard, you've done your extreme training, you've forged your sword, you've got the mental capability if, if, if needed. You need to start looking after your body and looking after your mind a little bit. It's okay to say no, you know, but trying to get over that yeah. is, you know. That's interesting. So we, we were talking about MMA and UFC a little bit and when we met the other day as well. <clears throat> Going on to your point there, one of the, one of the first things I noticed when this was happening in on the professional scene was when I heard of so you know Donald Cerrone, Cabo Cerrone. Yeah. Cerrone. So I heard a conversation, never made people corking on an interview, saying that cowboy now doesn't do any hard training. He doesn't even spar. Yeah. In preparation for his fights, he doesn't spar. Yeah. And I think it, to to your point there, he is. I mean, that man is made of fucking granite. That man has made a granite. Yeah. And I think his decision must be why I keep punishing myself in the gym, taking the hits in my head when I've got all that, that instinct is there. I've got it all. I'm mentally tough. Let's just peel it back a bit and focus on the almost a non destructive like yeah. training and fitness. I think that's does that make sense? Is yeah, that, that's, that's kind of the same thing. Yeah, he's and, and again he was a great fighter. You know, for me, what happens with fighters is they fight for too long. <coughs> you know, you only He's still fighting, isn't he? I think he's still fighting, okay. yeah. So he does some hideous knockouts recently as well, hasn't he? That's the thing, yeah. you know. So sooner or later, you know, if you're not prepared to kind of train like how you're supposed to train when you're being a fighter, especially sparring, sparring's a big part of it. You know, if if you can no longer spar, maybe it's time to get out. You know, but it's hard to stop that. There's a lot of fighters, you know, the probably the most, you know, renowned fighter in the world ever, Muhammad Ali. You know, there's a, there's a good chance that he fought for too long. You know, and and he was probably the greatest, but he couldn't get out. So for me, I'm a self, or mainly a self defense instructor, and self defense means defense of oneself. So you know, you you might want to forge that sword, and you might might want to get strong physically, mentally. But as you get a bit older, you need to bring the spiritual side into it. You need to slow your training down. Like me, I've totally changed my training. I used to like be doing a lot of sparring. Um, even when I wasn't competing, sparring a lot, grappling a lot, a lot of fitness, whereas now I'm more into my yoga training, um, swimming, I go out on my push bike, um, walking, being around nature. So I've, I've just to changed my training. You can be as intense though, right? So you can train, yeah. you can still train as frequently as you were before, but just l the the less impactful stuff, I think. Right? Yeah. I, I, I see your point. Yeah, I try yeah. and... I try to increase the amount of swimming I do. Yeah. For that reason, I've decreased the amount of running I do. Um, so now instead of running two or three times a week, I'll run once a week and I just do sprints. Yeah. And I just, I'll do sprints once a week. <coughs> and and, and I, I, I mean, contradicting myself here, I play rugby again. I started <laughs> rugby a few years ago. You know, yeah. I started boxing last year or the year before. And uh, so those things, I mean, I'm, they're a question mark in my mind at the minute. <laughs> yeah. It's but no, to your point, you know, um, you can, I think people think, well, I think when you're saying take your foot off the gas, it doesn't mean you, you can tr you train less frequently. It's just select the right training for, for longevity, really, yeah, isn't longevity, it? For longevity, that's, yeah. that's exactly what I was just about to say. It's, it's about longevity. So, you know, you get to a point where, you you know, you've got to kind of accept that you know you're not going to be able to mix it with with the young kids you know being as I was because I was a coach and I'm training a lot a lot of different age ranges I quite I started to really enjoy getting the young teenagers in and some of them are brilliant and they're sharp and they're fast and they recover a lot of it's to do with recovery so you know like for me if I train like I used to train 
it's going to take out of me. You know, you do 10, 10 rounds of sparring, you know, you break, you wake up, you can cuss a lot of the time. You don't even realise it, you know, like to recover at that when, you, when you're my age, which I'm 44 now, compared to when I was 21, 22, you don't recover from that kind of stuff. So sooner or later, you, you do have to stop. But it's, it's easier said than done. When you've got that mindset, for me, it's about longevity. You know, I want, I want to live for as long as I possibly can in the, on this material planet. Um, and by sparring and, and, you know, probably getting more TBIs, um, it's not really going to help. Mm. You know, so for me, I've just changed, just changed my, changed my mindset on it. But I had to dissolve my ego for that. Otherwise, if I hadn't have had my bike accident, I'd probably still be in the gym, working in the gym, and still doing the kind of training that I was doing. You know. So going back to the question before that, um, <clears throat> before the plant basing and the bike accident, so you, I think you were saying you became aware of the well-being, mental health thing before that, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. But was that as part of the gym? Of your experiences in the gym, I think it was part of having a, a like a martial arts instructor who was who was a writer as well, who's wrote some great books, and would quite would would, would sit after training and and he'd honestly talk about what he was scared of, so he'd talk about fears. He he got he went on the nightclub door, he went on worked on a door because he wasn't sure if his martial arts would work. So. If you pressure test a lot of the martial arts, that's when you get mixed martial arts. Because a lot of the traditional styles, karate, and a lot of them don't work in a real situation. Depending on the person who's doing them, you know, because there are guys who will make karate work. That depends on the opponent, right? It, and depending on the opponent, you know, people, there's no rules when you're standing in a pub. So, you know, most of the time, <coughs> if you take alcohol out of the situation, there isn't that many fights. You know, like it or not, you know, and and even domestic violence, which again can come from stems from alcohol a lot of the time. So if you take drink and drugs out of the equation, you don't get into many fights. And I've had you know years of people saying, well, you know, but if someone just that comes up and starts trouble on you, that doesn't happen very often, mate. You know, I was telling my patrons just yesterday about a confrontation I had in the street two days ago. So, yeah. and this was a sober confrontation. Yeah. To a point where I thought, what on, what is going on here? It was very, very strange. And, but the reason I'm saying it is because no, it never, that's never happened to me before. Yeah. In the street where someone's got aggressive. And uh, I won't go into the story, but it happened to me two days ago. Never happens. Yeah. But um, very unnerving. Very unnerving. Yeah. Because, because to your point, only most of the time before I've been in that situation, it's alcohol involved. And you, you, you perceive things differently than alcohol. Whether you're the aggressor or not, you know, yeah. whoever's starting the scrap for whatever reason or gobbing off, when you're stood in the street and you're minding your own business and you're just walking back from, for example, dropping your motorbike at the garage and some dude is being mental. Uh, very weird. But yeah, it doesn't happen very often. I had to get in there because I'm still surprised by it now. I go, what? Anyway, yeah. and it happened to near where I live as well. So I'll probably see the twat again. <laughs> anyway, anyway, so I hijack that. Yeah, I hijack that. Yeah, um, yeah go on, go on. So, generally, like, physical, com people just don't really want to fight. You know, we're animals. You know, if you get into a fight, even if, you know, I, I used to say to people, good self-defense is not getting into a fight. <clears throat> you know, because if you get into a fight and you get injured, or if you get into a fight and you hurt someone and you end up in a prison cell, who's going to pay your mortgage, you know? So, good self-defense is not being not being in that place. So, if you think most fights happen because of alcohol in them kind of environments if you avoid them environments you're probably not going to get into many situations you know, the thing is with training i think and kind of learning to have a fight it, it gives you confidence you know and that's what kind of people want to be able to feel safe and secure so a lot of it stems from fear you know but i know plenty of confident people who they're not fighters you know so it you can't know, be done in a different way that's the only reason I do it, is yeah. for confidence. Confident. But it's not confidence, It's so it's not what you said there. It's not confidence in, um, oh, I know I can handle myself if there's an issue, in the, like with that dude in the street. Right? Yeah. It's not because of that. I find if I'm doing something, uh, I, I first noticed it when I started doing BJJ. Yeah. But I stopped doing that, but 
years ago, I didn't do much of it. I did it, on, I did it very intensely for um, a relatively short period of time. But I noticed that it, it made me, I'd say confidence, yeah. I was I was more um, was content. I was more content in myself, just generally, yeah. generally. And it is as a result of being more physically capable, but it, 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 it didn't, it did make me think, oh, I can handle myself in that conscious way. I was just, I just felt more content, more, co- more competent in anything I was doing, yeah. anything I was doing. And then when I, when I stopped doing that <clears throat> for a few years, just because of this lifestyle and all the rest of it, I did notice a de- uh, uh, an impact on my, on my self confidence. Yeah. Um, and that's just why I started boxing again. One of the reasons I started boxing again yeah. for that reason. It's very, it's, a, it's an interesting thing. I mean, I would hate to be someone who, well, I, I, I have been that person in the past, who doesn't feel they're capable of just even just defending themselves. Because uh, because every situation you go into, uh, as any inkling of any form of escalation, because the first weapon you use is language, right? Body language. And body language. Body yeah. language and... and um, uh, vocal, like vocal language, yeah, vo- yeah. You know, vocal language. But if any si- any situation has a risk of escalation, well, the the escalation point is always up. The top end is always up to violence. It may not have, or get there, but if you're not or you're, if you're not confident at that violence point in just defending yourself, that impacts your your ability to engage body language wise and vocal language wise. It impacts the way you and I talk. You talk with a stranger in the street. You talk with someone at work. It's it's a very weird thing. So all that being physically capable at the top end, as in physically capable, if it goes that way, just defend yourself. For me, manifests itself at, you know, conversational level. Yeah. When it's not, it just, I'm not talking about having a conversation with people I think I'm going to scrap. I'm talking about having a conversation with anyone. Anyone. Yeah. You know, because you, you have more belief in what you think, what you say, what you do. You're more confident. You have, you, you can assert yourself. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with that. You know, and, and again, as a kid, as a street, going up as a street kid, you know, I kind of, I was fighting a lot because you kind of had to fight, you know, and, and I wanted to learn how to fight. But what I was taught is that when you, when you learn how to fight, on the way to learning that, you get humbled because you realise how many people around you are actually really good at it, you know, and, and people who you look at and you wouldn't think are good at it and they're, they're really good at it. So learning how to have a fight kind of humbles you so you you don't you start you start looking at other people very differently you don't judge judge a book by its cover so when you get confident in that way you should be able to let it go or if if you know again my instructor kind of said to us that if you come into a room people should be feel happy and more safe because you're in the room they shouldn't feel like you're going to be causing trouble which you get that with a lot of fighters, mm. especially when you mix alcohol with it. You'll get guys come into the room and it's like, oh, who's he going to hit tonight? You yeah. know, whereas it shouldn't be like that. Everyone should feel safe because you're in the room because they know that you're a good person like that. and that's that you're going to help yeah. people out. Yeah. You know, so that's that's where it's, that's where real confidence comes in. You know, but ego, especially when you're fighting all the time and you're training all the time, it's easy to to blow off, you know, and end up becoming a bully. You know, it's a fine line between being able to have a fight and being a bully, you know, and a lot of fighters end up being bullies, you know, and that's that's not what it's about, especially in the martial arts world. And this is where the, for me, the, the mixed martial arts has missed out a little bit on the etiquette from traditional martial arts. You know, there's there's no respect there sometimes, you know, because if you shout your mouth off and trash talk as a fighter, you get paid more money for it. So there's that fine line there where if, if you're really brilliant anyway, you know, and you've got good etiquette, you don't need to put it on. You know, if you look at some of the great champions, you like your Anderson Silvers, uh, George St. Pierre, your Randy Couture's, all them great fighters, none of them ever really trash talked because... It was different then. It wasn't yeah. as big then, was it? That's the thing. It wasn't the money-making machine it is now, I think. Maybe, maybe not, but it's, you know, when Conor McGregor got on the got on the microphone and, and you know, a, a great fighter, the first ever two-time two-weight champion in, in mixed martial arts. Um, and a lot of it was tongue-in-cheek, what he said. But because of the way he acted, all of a sudden he's getting paid millions. You know, like... Ali millions. was a gobshite, though. Ali, Ali was Ali a did, Yeah, Ali, <laughs> Ali knew how to do it. He was the first ever to do it, wasn't he? But again, it was all tongue-in-cheek. 
You know, like Tyson Fury's pretty good at it. You know, he's he's good at he's like really turned things around, and he's and he's, he's he seems like a great character. Um, but again, he knows how to use he knows how to use the media. You know, and, and that's that's probably got him a lot more money. It's a shame that a fighter can't get paid just as much by I being used, a good I fighter. I used to hate him. I used to I used to severely dislike Tyson Fury, and then I uh, because of that gobshite thing, I didn't like it. Yeah. At all, right? I was like, oh god, he's just, just a bellend. He's a gypsy bellend. <laughs> what you think? And then I watched an interview with him. It was his first one. It was the only one he did with Joe Rogan. And it was, it was only about an hour. Joe was in only two or three hours. <clears throat> it was only about an hour. But he was he, he was Tyson Fury. Have you have you watched that? Listen to that interview. Yeah, I've I've, I've watched okay, Tyson right. Fury right since his first uh, fight. Yeah. And he he talking it's an hour of him talking openly about mental health his journey yeah what it was like when he won that you know w- w- i can't remember which belt he won and then went off the rails being completely open and candid yeah and he wasn't put on the front he was he was there to and the reason he was doing that he was there to convey the you know that mental health message he was there yeah. to convey like, like even the best of us go down the pan and i thought that was amazing because his whole persona was built on like mcgregor like even fury still is now slightly his whole personal persona his public his public persona was built on gobshite gypsy hard um you know uh you know will knock you out with his words never mind his like yeah. fists uh and would wind everyone up but in that interview he parked all that to convey the message and yeah. talk about his own experiences which at that point we're talking uh, quite a few years ago now maybe four years ago yeah at that point you would think, I mean, if you went to a PR agency and and, and, and he'd said, oh, this, I fancy doing, I'm, this is, I want to do, want to do that. They, they, they don't do that. It's going to damage your brand. Yeah. You know, they, you know, it was a very dangerous thing to do. He did it anyway. I, I have huge respect for him as a result. Well, it enhanced his brand, I think, <coughs> you know, because he, he got the word out there. You know, and, and again, I think he's always suffered with um, some mental health problems. Who doesn't, man? But I do, I, yeah, yeah. I, I personally believe... If you're going to abuse your body the way he abused his body with with a lot copious amounts of cocaine and alcohol, you're going to get mental health problems. You know, yep. ab- abuse abuse the abuse the body and the mind will follow. You can guarantee it, especially with cocaine. It's such a horrible drug, you know, and it's used so much. You know, it's it's it's. But again, people are trying to run away from fears, and so I, I kind of have quite a bit of um, compassion for these people because. We're looking for escapism instead of sitting there with our shadows and dealing with the the actual problems. No one wants to do that, do they? No. no. I heard a... I can't remember I was watching yesterday something. I was doing some mindless scrolling through flipping something online. And it might have even been an ad. might have even been an ad for an Airbnb place in Italy, of all places. Anyway, <laughs> this it said, oh, Italian... It said uh, uh, traditional Italian proverb or phrase or something. And it said... The, 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 the forgotten art or the lost art of do- oh no, it's just the art of doing nothing, and then it adds some clips of just Italians like sat there in the coffee shop, mm-hmm. you know, just having a coffee, just sit or just whatever, sit outside, just chill out, doing nothing, and I and, and I thought that yes, yeah, the art of doing nothing, we've lost it, just sit there and do nothing. I got up this morning, I'm terrible for it myself because I always have to, we talked about it before, I always have to be doing something, mm-hmm. and I woke up this morning came downstairs and normally I'll you know get on the phone check everything emails Twitter Instagram flipping you just check everything right and th- I set up this morning and I was like Italians the art of doing nothing no yeah. we do nothing and I set a timer for 10 minutes yeah. like no and I sat there doing nothing but <clears throat> you end up looking at yourself yeah thinking about the day looking at yourself what thinking a bit more in depth about why you want to do something why you want to do something why you feel the way you do how you're going to plan it all is Without even thinking about it, your mind goes to places that it wouldn't go if it didn't give it the space to do it. Which is why I think things like the the dietas are so incredibly powerful. Massive. Incredibly powerful. Even yeah. just getting outside in general, but going and doing something like that, incredibly powerful. Yeah. Completely changing your uh, your environment. How did your ego impact you then? You've mentioned your ego being a drama a few times. That start in the gym. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's definitely. You know, I, th- I don't think you can. It's very hard to be a fighter and not have an ego, 
you know, or to do anything, you know, your ego, I'm very grateful for my ego. I, I wouldn't be here today without my <clears> ego. So my ego served me for a long time. When, when I was able to be that, that warrior, as I call it, um, it, it was my best friend, you know, it helped me get good at what I did, you know, it helped me earn a living. But sooner or later, that warrior had to, you know, he had to go and have a rest. So I had to put my warrior away, you know, and let my statesman or my chief come out, you know, because if you stay as a warrior for too long, you, you know, your mind's going to go, your body's going to go, you know, you can't keep mixing it all the way through. But yeah, my ego, your ego helps you survive, doesn't it? But there's a time to park that bus, you know, but working in a gym, you kind of put on this kind of front and people kind of are rubbing your ego all the time by telling you how good you are and people saying you should train with him, he's great, he's this, he's that, and you're like, oh, well, it's not about the ego when your ego's getting rubbed constantly, you know? So I am grateful for that ego, but I had to dissolve my ego to to move on, to move to the next stage of my life. And I had to take my armour off and by taking my armor off, I feel a lot lighter. I don't feel that need to be the best this, be that, be that, you know, because I'm comfortable with my, my own skin. I'm comfortable inside now. Whereas before it was all external. It was all, all I wanted to look the part. You know, I wanted to be this, I wanted to do that. I don't feel the need to do that anymore because I've worked on my ego. Um, and I understand the ego, I understand the process, that the ego is there for your drive, it can help you out, um, but don't get wrapped up in your ego for too long. You know, if you don't move on, you'll, you'll end up being stuck. How did you go about moving on from that then, before you were introduced to plant medicine? How did you, what was that process? I thought I was, I thought I'd actually, like, I, I'd, I, when I did some <coughs> workshops and seminars, I'd always talk about leave your ego at the door, it's not about your ego, um, but at the time I'd created this person who was being dominated by his ego, you know, so although I was saying, and I knew that it wasn't about the ego, I hadn't actually made the transition. So my ego was still the dominant voice in my body. But practically, how was that causing problems? What was the issue? I was putting on front. So then, like, you know, like you talked earlier about getting angry. Yeah. You know, like, or someone coming into your world and you, you react to it. You know, so you're creating the problems. You know, it's like, if you're giving off, we're all, we're all made of energy. We've all got energy in us. If your energy's dark and you're giving off negative energy because you're thinking about fighting or in the gyms, a lot of people are thinking about fighting or fucking, you know, and... It's, it's that's going to create problems in your world you know so if while your ego is dominant you're going to react so you're going to create problems it starts becoming metaphysical you know if all you're thinking about is fighting you're going to walk down the street and you're going to give off that energy that you want to fight so someone's going to look at you and the body language is going to be different so what i learned is that and it was through plant medicine that i've made that transition i knew about the ego i knew to leave the ego at the door I knew not to react, but I was still dominated by my ego. So I was saying the right things. I was talking the talk, but I wasn't kind of walking the talk. Whereas now I don't feel that need to try and compete with these young kids coming up who are doing really well, who are going to be the next generation of fighters. I don't feel the need to compete with my own sons or with anyone because I know what I've got. I know what I'm about. I know what I've done. And I'm quite happy to look forward instead of looking back and looking at the past. So that's really helped me. I thought I had it. I thought I'd worked out the ego, but I was still doing a lot of stuff where my ego was dominant. Yeah, had you ever dabbled with any form of drugs before where you went into? Yeah, yeah, a little bit, especially when I was younger. I used cannabis quite a lot as well. Um, I used to think cannabis helped me sleep. Um, so I used cannabis a lot. I lost my brother. So. I was getting night terrors from that. Um, and I thought the cannabis helped me sleep. So How old was your brother? My brother was 29. So um, my brother... Um, see, this is again where I knew about mental health. My brother took his own life. Uh, and I found him. So that created major trauma in me. It gave me some PTSD. Um, or PTS, as I, as I prefer to call it. Um, 
And again, I thought I'd worked on that. I thought I'd dealt with that. But, you know, them kind of traumas, you dig them down and you push them down into your stomach. And they come out in different ways. And that's why I was still a bit aggressive. Still, could, someone could make me angry for no reason. Because I had a lot of anger to come out. You know, when, when, when someone who you love does that, there's a lot of why. Why this, why that. You know, and I kind of got stuck. It became my narrative. You know, that, that became my story. It became my identification. Uh, your brother taking his life? My brother took his life. Who's your, who's your older brother? My older brother, yeah. I was um, 26 at the time. Uh, I just had my first son. Um, was he a fighter? My brother? Yeah, he was pretty good. He used to train quite quite a lot. He was very natural, but he was quite... He had quite a. He was quite a pacifist, so he didn't really ever want to hurt anyone. <laughs> but he was very, very good, very good wrestler at the time, you know. But um, again, just the areas were brought up in, kind of dragged up. No, no male male role models. No positive male role models. And you know, my dad weren't really about. Um, bless him, you know. But and again, I, I, that that bothered me a lot for a long time. You know, my own dad. You know, because I thought he'd left us and he'd deserted us. But when I found out about his life and what happened to him, he starts to feel a bit of compassion for him. What was his, what was his story? He went to the Navy, um, I think at 15 or 16. And then when he came back, his family had, had <coughs> moved and hadn't even told him. Oh, my God. <laughs> so you kind of go, wow. You know, like that's that's kind of like... You're Coventry, right? Coventry. Coventry. Was he from Coventry as well? He's from Coventry, yeah. So I was born in Gosport. I was actually born down in, in on a on a navy base. Um See Dad was the server when you were born. Yeah. Yeah. That's when how you met my mum. My mum's from Malta, so he, he went to Malta and served in Malta and met my mum there. Uh -huh. So yeah. So when you say he went to the navy and then came back so fifteen, sixteen, young, and then came back and they moved but Came back from what you mean? Came back? He like came, came back, back from after serving, from serving for a few years away in the navy, and they'd come back and they'd moved. So he's still house. young, like still young, 18, 19, still eighteen, and they bugged out somewhere else. Yeah. So again, a lot of the time with our parents, who sometimes we can blame our parents for everything, you know. But sooner or later, you have to kind of take your own responsibility, you know. And it's easy to live twenty years ago. Like I said, with what happened with my brother, it, it actually became my identification, where it was like I had a bit of a breakdown. Um, and I worked my way back up and I built myself up to being strong again physically and mentally but I'd always hung on to the fact of what my brother did because ne you can never work out why you know you can never find out why why has someone took their own life you know and, it, and it's it's a hard thing to live with Was there any build up to it with him? Was there, any was there was a little bit but it was like it was nearly 18 years ago so at the time you know mental health wasn't Mm. as it is now you know so w i knew he wasn't very well but i wasn't i wasn't um knowledgeable enough to to know how to deal with that whereas i've spent a lot of time trying to look at that you know and, and i think the whole planet you know everyone knows a little bit more about mental health now you know and, and it's it's still going strong you know but men need to just talk they just need to talk to each other a little bit more. The women are much better at it. You know. Yeah, the problem is, right, <laughs> is how you convey that message to blokes. So if you go, like, I hear you saying that. Yeah. Oh, and what's the other one? The one that just, oh, uh, it's all right for men to cry. And yeah. that, I mean, when you talk about, like, if you got, like, a marketing agency involved, and went, right, this is the message you want to give to blokes. Be be more aware of your mental health. Yeah. And it's something that you can table in conversation. How do you think we should bring that to pe pe people's minds, men's minds? Do you know what they wouldn't choose? Oh, the slogan, it's all right for men to cry. They wouldn't. Yeah. Because we're, like it's you, we're ego-driven. We're yeah. full of adrenaline, masculine. It's just... <clears throat> and, and that the crying thing connects itself with f femininity, weakness... <clears throat> that's what we associate it with, but that's a myth, though, isn't it? I, I well, it's a myth, really, isn't it? Like, because we want to be masculine, yeah, but like, is being masculine not being honest as well and being authentic? I don't know. I've not thought about that before. Well, it, well, for me, it is. 
you know, it's about having your integrity and being honest. That's a good point. So yeah. if you're saying to like my sons, well, my sons are 17 and 19, you know, and I'm, 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 I want them to be honest and full of integrity, and then they come and speak to me about something and they get upset, then they're being honest, mm. you know, and they're being yeah, authentic. Yeah. So for me, that's that's masculinity as well. It's just we've we've been we've been programmed to be providers, and you know, stiff up a lip. You know, and, and it's so we've been brought up like with that kind of M slogans. You know, stiff up a lip, you know, keep calm and carry on. What kind of slogans that? You know, but that's what we've been brought up in because we've been brought up by people who were in the wars. You know, they were like they were war generations. So men weren't allowed to kind of put on that to cry, you know. But if you want to be masculine, you know, or you want to be authentic, which is I want to just be authentic. I just want to be honest and tell people how it really is. You know, if they want to know, I'm not going to tell someone how it really is if they haven't opened that up for me to tell them, you know, because otherwise you start becoming a bit of a bully and you just say whatever you want, you know, well, I don't care. I'm just telling the truth. And it's like, well, whose truth is it? It's your truth. It doesn't mean it's their truth. So for me, authenticity is, is key. So if you're feeling a bit shit, yeah, and you can't phone your mate up and go, or, you know, I've recently been divorced or whatever's happened in your life. I'm missing my wife. I'm missing my ex-wife. You know, like if you can't phone your friend up and tell him that, then you're not being authentic. You're not being masculine. Oh. <laughs> or I love the way you stick your chest oh. out there. It, yeah. no, I mean, yeah. You know, I, <clears throat> or you haven't got people around you you can do that with. Yeah, like, maybe you because haven't got that. Yeah. I've had that where I've been able to ring someone up. Yeah. And well, I mean, probably one of the things that, one of the only reasons I'm still sitting here today, I was able to ring someone up and go, I fucking hated doing it, mind. I hated doing it. I hated doing it. I hate it, but you made me do it. Um, back, coming back to the it's okay for men to talk thing, I'm not saying that's a, a, that is incorrect. I'm saying that's correct, absolutely. But I think when you hear that message, and the other one is it's okay for men to cry, when people hear, when blokes hear that message, general populace, and you're just in general, blokes in general, I'm generalizing, then their perception of what that looks like what that it, what that conversation looks like is not how the conversation actually looks among men who can have that conversation the point i'm making is it's okay for it uh, so uh, uh men should talk about the mental health what that doesn't look like in normal conversation is this oh i'm miserable and i'm sad and everyone yeah. giving me attention because that's how they perceive it they you know <clears throat> what it looks like is this <clears throat> Probably like yourself, I'm assuming you've got to, well, definitely have you got Keith and, and all those other incredible people in your life, right? I've got a circle of friends, most of them ex-military, and we are, we've all had our own experiences, either through ourselves or friends who have had real bad mental ill health. And obviously some of them aren't, aren't around anymore. And we can openly have conversation about mental health. But the way that looks, if you were looking at us from the outside, four or five people having a conversation, or even just one or two of us together talking, you wouldn't think we were talking about mental health. The way that conversation looks is like this, it, from the from the bat. So how, from off the off, from off the bat, how are you doing, you? Yeah, I'm right. Uh, it well, bit bit stressed at the minute. I had a horrendous anxiety yesterday, but I think it's because of that's how it looks. That's talking about mental health. So when someone asks me if one of those guys, like, well, if anyone asks me now, how are you? To your point, I will answer honestly, absolutely honestly, because one, that is a major part of addressing your own mental health in general, whether it's good or bad. It's ident same as your physical health, right? It's, like, it's accepting there's a, there's, a, there's a drama, so overcome it. A little bit of anxiety is a little bit of anxiety. It doesn't mean you've got any like major syndrome or illness, yeah. but in answering honestly. So if they were to ask me, if you were to say, um, how how are you? How are you? No, and I had a physical injury. I did probably every. This is ten years ago. Every chance in the world, I pipe up and go, "Yeah, I'm right." My fucking knee is killing me. My knee is wrecked. The other day, blah 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 blah. The only difference between me then and me now is, I bring in the mental health side. I'll answer honestly about my health in general. Yeah, it's made up of two aspects, right? And I think that's a really important thing, for 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 blokes who, you know, whatever, not not. They know they're not feeling great at the minute. 
They don't know how to express it. They don't know how to broach it. The first port in the call is, like you said, the conversation. Speak to a mate. And it doesn't look like, what it doesn't look like is, you know, going in and and bringing it up in conversation with a friend or a colleague in a really <sighs> effeminate way. That's not what it has to look like. No. It's, you get asked all the time, on a daily basis, how are you? All it looks like you answer honestly. I'm not great at the minute. I'm not great at the minute. Yeah, and and what it also does, and it helps you expand your knowledge on it, because in those conversations, you'll get advice on what to do or how to deal with it, or give me give me a call again tomorrow, mate. Be still like that. Yeah, you call them back. Or have you tried this? Have you tried that? Have you tried X Y Z. You know, we were talking, we were talking the other day about the the cannabis, about the the, the sleep thing, and people do think it helps you to sleep. I fuck it doesn't help sleep. You think it helps us sleep. Yeah. Maybe it helps you get to sleep. Don't reach REM sleep. But the quality of that sleep is shocking. Yeah. It's shocking. You know. So um if you don't reach REM sleep, your brain oh, is there, sorry. But yeah, no, you're right what you're saying about <coughs> talking to friends. If you're lucky, you might have some friends in your life that you can talk about. You know, I've got I've got some you know, Tony Summers, Glenn Smith. I've got I've got loads of friends who I can actually talk about it, but I think it's because I brought it to the table a lot of the time. And my, my martial arts instructor who was abused as a kid, he, you know, wrote a book about it, you know, and, and he forgave the person who abused him who, where he could have <coughs> he could have killed him kind of thing. So it was brought to the table, you know, that's and that, that's point. the difference. That's a good you know, point. It's like if you can bring that to the table and the environment and where you do it, because for years and years, men have been moaning about things and talking and being honest, but most of the time they've found themselves doing it while drinking beer, and then they drink more beer, and then they create more problems. So you set and setting, like like with psychedelics, is really important. So for me, you've got to bring that to the table. You've got to do it in the right place. You know, if if you want to if you want to help your friend who's not feeling that good, don't take him down the pub. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Take take him for a walk, yeah. yeah. Where you can be on your own, where you're around nature, where you're getting fresh air, and just be there for him. Just be there to listen. That's a good point. Yeah. You know, so your setting setting is is really really important. Well, bring it to the table. Like that's a really good point. Bring it to the table is kind of like being the fighter that people want to be around yeah. or they feel safe when they're there. Definitely. So, because by bringing it to the table, that may be difficult for yourself doing it if you've never done it before. You know, if you've never mentioned it, you guarantee that people listen to this, right? Guarantee it. And they have been feeling stress for months, if not years. Been fucking miserable. It's always underlying. They just stiff up a lip. They're just yeah. going through it. They're a bloke. They're just going through getting on with it. Or even, yeah. or even you get like women in those positions, uncommonly, but women in those positions. I always think back to um, the example of like single mums, mate. Single mums yeah. wow. with one or two kids. And jobs, and and a job or two jobs or three jobs, mate. Yeah. That can you imagine that? Especially when they've got boys. Oh my Especially god! Especially when they've got boys. No, because the boys yeah. will rebel. Boys will get to being teenagers, and you know, and and women, you know, people talk about mental health, and they, a lot of it has been about men, but you know, the women are, are there as well. You know, it has to be. We have to be one in this. There can be no masculine and feminine. It has to be. You know, yeah. we're in this together. Because women, women, and women <coughs> commit suicide as well, you know. So we have to, we have to, t we have to deal with it better. Sometimes look, I've got four beautiful sisters, you know, and a beautiful mum. So having that feminine side for me always, you know, you were saying earlier how how did I get to where I got to? I had like the gym and some real good like physical male role models, but then I also lived with four women and my mum, five women, you know, and my brother at the time. So. I had a. When I look back, I think the balance was there. The male, the masculinity, and the feminine, the feminine side were there anyway. You know, but it's like people talk about ayahuasca and they talk about um, mother ayahuasca, and and it has got a lot of feminine aspects to it. But you know, like taking ayahuasca is not a, a feminine thing. You know, you're purging and sometimes shitting yourself. You know, and, and you're going to hell. You know, so it's although it's got a very beautiful loving side, it's also got a very masculine dark side. You know, so for me with mental health, you know, it might be a woman who you talk to, it might be a woman who you open up to, but as long as you're being authentic and you're bringing it to the table, 
that's important. Set and setting's important, you know. And, and I feel for the military guys because you guys have been trained, yeah, to basically go to war and to go and do some horrible things that go against natural kind of, you know, it, it goes against nature a little bit. You can't be crying. You can't be doing this and doing that. You're built to be a machine, you know. So to try and broach that after is is quite a hard thing to do, you know. So sometimes it's the way we've been brought up. You know, like I said, our sayings are like <clears throat> said earlier, you know, keep calm and carry on, stiff up a lip. You know, if, if you go to Costa, Costa Rica, their sayings are viva, viva la vida, I think it is, live life. You know, that's more of a saying, but, you know, we were bombed, you know, especially Coventry. Coventry's got some real history about it, but so was the UK. It was, it was bombed in the wars, and then you're being brought up by generations who had to be hard. They had to deal with things. But we're not in that generation anymore. We've changed, you know, so we <sighs> should be able to bring it to the table. I can still be a man. I can still be masculine, but I can still be feminine. Yeah, and it makes you no less capable or hard I, I think this is the other thing so if you look it actually makes you more capable that's the way i think mate. Yeah. i am at my sharpest when i'm my physical training is going really well and when i am on top of my game mentally and the way i stay on top of my game mentally is being aware of myself mentally and cutting out bad habits and yeah. and give myself time to step away and making sure i change my environment making sure i get a bit uncomfortable every so often making sure i think a little bit in depth about why my brain is doing what it's doing yeah. and that makes me a more capable human being in whatever situation whether you're a soldier sailor airman flipping fighter copper yeah a person who works in an office yeah it do you know matter. what i mean it doesn't it, matter, it doesn't does matter. It? you're it's more human. capable you, you we, <laughs> that's a great thing yeah you're a more capable human how can i help other humans or how can you know you need to help yourself first yeah. You know, it's like no good trying to heal other people if you're not healed yourself. I want to yeah. come on to the ayahuasca thing in a minute, but uh, the, the experience in a minute. But on, I just want to go back there on the subject of bringing it to the, bringing it to the table, bringing the mental health to the table. Like f again, for those for those people who are, they want to do that, they don't know how to do it. It's a bit of pain to go through it the first time, as in just to even decide. Oh, I'm going to be honest about answering the question of how are you, mate? You know, just going to be open and honest yeah. about it. Um, but in doing that, when you to your point there, my when you bring it to the table, you are making you are making other people because other people are going through the same thing. Yeah. You are making it easier for them to do the same thing because they'll see you do it and you're opening up the door for them to do it as well. When I when I started at my current job for I work for Imasa, and when I started there uh, three and a half years ago, I was I wasn't I was not in a great place at all, and I started doing. So meditation, I'd started it a year before. In there, I started doing a med uh, taking a meditation session every month or... Oh, was it, no, it was a, once a week I started doing it. Um, I go, right, I'm going down to meditate at 12 o'clock for 10 minutes, that's all it is. Uh, would anyone want to join me? And I put it out by email. We go into the room um, and I would... I'd use a meditation app. I put it on the speakers in the room, so I wouldn't take in the med I was doing the meditation too. It was a problem because I could fall asleep. <laughs> 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 but we'd, do, we'd all do the meditation, 10 minutes, and people would gradually get more coming down. We had about 15 at one point, mostly women. There was a couple of blokes that come down. But at the end of it, when we when we finished, I'd stand at the door and, you know, you know thanks for coming down and do it with me, blah, 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 as they all went back up to uh, to the office. But I'd always, I'd always make a point of saying... I really need, words to the effect of I really needed that today. I was stressed this morning, flipping like a loads on. Uh, I always made a point of saying that I needed it for X, X negative reason, and it was generally true. But as it went on, people would also start coming up with, "Yeah, I I did too. I had this X, Y, or Z yesterday, or this feeling today." They started talking about their own feelings openly. I didn't think any less of them. They don't think any less of me. But they're opening it up and airing it, and they're feeling better as, as a result. Going to the point of you bring it to the table. If yeah. you bring it to the table, you are that positive. You are that positive influence. And no matter how bad things are in your head or in your mind, when you start being a positive influence for other people, that 100% improves your own situation. 
Definitely. 100% you improve your own situation yeah. because you are value to people. It's one of the most incredible things you can have. You can demonstrate to yourself and it will elevate you and help you deal with your own situation yeah. better. Definitely, definitely. But, you know, what you're doing there is great. I think, you know, you're leading by example, you know, and that's what we've got to do. We've just got to lead by example, you know, and, and it can be difficult, especially, it doesn't, and it doesn't matter if you're a man or woman, it can be difficult to bring that to the table because... People start saying, oh, he's always this. You know, people don't look for solutions. You know, it's like, okay, there's a problem there. Okay, so what are you doing about the problem? You know, and people go on about mental health, but then they're not, they, they don't look at their diet. You know, well, what self-care practices are you doing? You know, are you sitting there and concentrating on your breathing? You know, and are you telling people when you're actually feeling good? You know, because again, it's like, well, if you, if you tell someone you're feeling good or you're doing great, sometimes people think, oh, it's all right for them. You know, so we've just got to be honest. So when you feel good, you feel good. When you feel bad, you feel bad. You know, and talk about it. Motivate people. Motivate them when they're not feeling great. Motivate them because you're feeling great and, and it might help them feel better. You know, but what you did there is, you know, met some meditation, which is a difficult practice. You know, it's, it takes a lot of consistency to get to get right. Just some mindfulness, you know, just bringing it to the table is, is beneficial. But for me, you've got to be a certain character to be brave enough to bring that to the table. You know. Yeah, I I think it's for the same reason as your experiences, really. It's yeah. because you never know who's suffering, mate. That's right. Yeah. I don't want other people to go through what some of my mates have gone through, aren't you anymore? Like you know, like your brother. It's yeah. Just, it's just. Uh, you don't want that to happen to anyone. You know, there's always another no day. No one should you know? uh, have no, that pain. No one should no go one, through that. No one should have it whatsoever. Yeah. How did you? How did you discover ayahuasca then? Okay, so um, I'd used m magic mushrooms as a kid with my brother, actually. I had some <laughs> pretty, pretty amazing kind of experiences. Um, it's, it's really funny because I remember reading about it as a kid as well. Reading um, about ayahuasca? Reading about plant medicine and, and what they, they used to do in, in Peru. Um, so I always had this kind of like affiliation that I wanted to go there and... I started just researching it a little bit more, especially when I was when I'd, I'd my accident. I couldn't train, so I was like re reading a lot, um, and I felt I got a calling. I felt I got a calling to to ayahuasca to, to go and take ayahuasca. You know, I was reading quite a bit about Terence McKenna, Dennis McKenna, um, you Robin Carhart Harris, Rosalind Watts. You know, a lot of these. There was some good pioneers, science. Pioneers in psychedelic yeah, research. You know, right? Roland Griffiths, Stanislav Grof. There's, there's, there's some amazing people out there. And this isn't new. You know, these, these, these um, indigenous tribes have been using these medicines for, for, for years. And even if you look at what went on in the 60s, although we weren't ready for that and it got corrupted, there were still some brilliant experiments that went on there and, and they kind of knew the answers. I think even if you look at... Um, Alcoholics Anonymous, one of the one of the guys who was involved in that had actually wanted to bring LSD into them circles because he'd had a trip and that's what had actually got him off alcohol. So, <laughs> there's, you know, the, the, the proof's there, but it's just we weren't quite ready for it. And obviously with the war on drugs, it was soon stopped, you know, and, and people are still, especially in the UK, people are still trying to get over all psychedelics, all drugs, you know, and it's like, it's, they're not drugs actually, you know, they're plants, you know, so they're more natural than anything. And that's, I'm not saying that Western drugs and pharmaceutical drugs haven't got a place because they have, you know, and we've got to remember that. But what for me, I was always there physically strong, mentally strong, or thought mentally strong, and I was missing on a spiritual side. So for me, the plant medicine, got me into that spiritual aspect when you say spiritual aspect like are you talking about here in the is, is, is the context of that here spiritual being i know you're going to say more connected to yourself more aware of yourself yeah. and what you are and what you're about Def really emo emo uh, emotional awareness yeah. at the base level right yeah so it's not it's not really a religious thing i'm, I'm talking about i'm talking about being connected to your mind, body, and spirit, you know, because whatever your belief is in God, you know, like I believe there's an energy, you know, I'm breathing, you know, and, and I might be breathing because my brain knows 
that I have to breathe and it's breathing for me, you know, because it's connected to my gut and, but I believe there's an energy and whenever, when I die, that energy will manifest into something else. So it doesn't matter what your belief is, you know, if your belief is breath, then that's fine. You know, if that's your God, because while we're breathing, we're alive, you know, we're sitting around in this conversation. So for me, when I say spiritual, it means sitting there and connecting to my body or connecting to my spirit or connecting to other people's spirits um, and doing them self-care practices where I'm thinking about myself. I lived in my head for too long. It was always doing, doing, doing. I was a human doing instead of a human being, you know, whereas now... <laughs> that is a great yeah. thing. What a thing that is. I need to remember that. I was uh, a human doing, not a human being. Yeah. Darry, I've never heard so, that before. So now I'm. Oh I'm, my God. I need to remember that. That's yeah, incredible. I'm just concentrate on being a human being. Brilliant. Now, you know, and, and we're, we're, there's so many distractions and, and so many things to get wrapped up in. You know, like, like you were saying earlier about you get up in the morning, you're on your phone. You know, if, if there's a great guy out there called Andrew Huberman who. He's he is in, brilliant. Yeah, he's, he he's is an amazing God. And, and I've learned from him that when I get up, my phone's, my wireless is not on anyway, you know, so I'm not on the internet or not on my phone sometimes until the afternoon. You know, I'll bring it with me because it's a self-defense tool. If, if I broke down or had an accident, I might need to phone someone. So, but don't get wrapped up in that. Don't go on the internet. So again, there's there's a lot of different things you can do. But it's just trying to be in touch with yourself. I lived in my head for so long that I didn't realise that I actually did get fear because I dealt with I'd I'd been sat in fear for so many so long, you know, going in and fighting and 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 living that kind of gym world where you're going in and you're dealing with fear. You sleep, you know, to be a fighter, you've got a you're going to have fear in your body all the time. But if you're not recognising it, that's when it becomes stressful because you'll start taking out on people around you, you know. You, the people who you love, you'll be an idiot to, you know, or you'll treat them like shit because you've got fear. You're not connected to your body. And it's like anxiety. You were saying earlier, you you know, you, you might feel a bit anxious. Where are you feeling that? Sit with it a bit. Recognise it. And recognise that it's quite a natural feeling. You know, it's, it's natural if you're going to be in a dangerous situation to get adrenaline. The adrenaline's there to help you. You know, it'll make you faster. It'll make you be able to run quicker so you can get out of the situation. It'll make you stronger so you can deal with the situation better. But what we've done is because people are so focused on being happy, that if they're not happy, there's something wrong. <clears throat> Whereas for me, it's like sit with your emotions. Where are you feeling your anxiety? Are you feeling that in your stomach? Where are you feeling your depression? Where are you feeling your PTSD? Have you got a heavy heart? And connect to that because we're all in our head so much that we forgot about connecting to our bodies. And for me, a spiritual practice is when I connect to my body. And to do that, it just makes me feel better. You know, so if I got up yesterday, I went yoga, I went and sat in a sauna and a steam room for a little bit. I got home and I felt great. And that was enough for me. I'd connected to my body. I connected to my mind. I connected to my spirit. That's, that's all you need. We've got every, most of us, are, you know, I'm very privileged. I'm very lucky to to have a, somewhere to live, and to have food, and I've got a beautiful family. That list can go on and on and on, but if I've got somewhere to live and I've got food, I've got everything I need. You know, so sometimes we forget what we actually, the necessities, and a lot of the distractions, they're not real necessities. They're not things we actually need. So... What what's the point? You know, we waste our t we waste a lot of our time doing things that have got no benefits to us. You know, we're not going to take our phones with us when we die. You know, someone will try. Someone will try. <laughs> Guarantee it. <laughs> <laughs> and good good luck get to them as well. You know, so get that last phone, TikTok video in. Yeah, yeah. The, the phones the phones are amazing. The internet's amazing. It's helped us connect. We can talk to people, you know, on on the other side of the world, and and it's it's got some amazing things. You know. I'm, I'm all for technology, but there's a time and a place for it. There's a time to sit there if you're eating food with your family, to not have your phone, you know, and, and be, be with the person who you're with. And that, that's why I love podcasts, because you've got two people going old school, 
just talking to each other. You know, and then you've got millions of people watching it. You know, like people say what they want about Joe Rogan. The guy's taking things to another level. You know, and it, and it's helped. But the thing is with podcasts is people and books, people are getting information, but they're not doing anything with the information. Apply the information. You know, people did it with self-help books. Self-help books 10 years ago. People would, would read one self-help book and then go and find another self-help book and then find another one and another one. And it's like, apply the information. If you hear some good information, you know, like Wim Hof's gone mainstream on TV, doing the breathing exercises, then breathing exercises are really beneficial. Yeah. yeah. Do them. Don't yeah. talk about them or say, oh, have you seen this? Have you seen that? Just do it. Apply the information because the internet does give us a lot of information. But it's no good just watching 100 podcasts and not, not taking on any of the information. You know, that's for me is what's missing a little bit. You know, and with me, with plant medicine, finding that sp them spiritual practices, sitting in my garden with no distractions, if you're lucky listening to the birds, you'll, you'll gain from that, you'll learn from that. You know, we can learn a lot from nature. You know, so by the time I got to doing my first ayahuasca retreat um, with a Shipibo tradition, the healing was immense. Do you remember that, Mike? Yeah, the, the healing was immense. And, you know, my first, I went to Soltara, who, who again are creating some amazing healing. And. Soltara? Soltara is uh, it's a retreat center. It's, they've got they've got in Costa Rica. They've just brought the Medicina as well. So uh, they've got some real good lineage with the Chipibo tradition. And they're doing some good healing. So that was the first place I went. I wanted to go to Peru, but um, having such a, a big family and, and wanting everyone to feel safe that I was going off and doing this, I, you know, I was able to show them Soltara. It's a beautiful place. They had a beach there. Um, and again, what I love about the plant medicine is when you prepare for a, to go and take ayahuasca, the restrictions come in. There's no caffeine. Um, no sex first time I gave my wife a sex ban um, <laughs> for how long? For how long? it's usually the other way around uh, it's usually two weeks before and two weeks after and how long is the trip so, in between? Uh, a week oh, God. so yeah <laughs> but again energy is used up in sex you know obviously sex, sex can be a very beautiful thing but also sex can be a very big voice and can cause major problems in the world you know so again it's <coughs> got to be treated with respect um, yeah no red meat no pork so there's, there's a lot of restrictions but what I love about going and preparing for your ayahuasca um, ceremonies is that if you lived your life and you were preparing for your ayahuasca ceremony and you didn't take ayahuasca and then you carried on with the integration, you've changed your lifestyle. You're living actually a quite healthy lifestyle. So when you're taking it serious, which I take things very serious, too serious sometimes, I wanted to prepare myself really good. So I, I did a month of where my diet was really good, no caffeine, no sugar, uh, no red meat, no pork. Um, no sex, uh, and 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 I changed I changed my lifestyle. I, I was quite good anyway with with certain aspects, especially my food. But I was a coffee fiend. I loved coffee, but I stopped drinking caffeine, which again in turn helped me sleep so much better. Um, so my preparation for ayahuasca was really good, um, but it changed my lifestyle. It got me being more of a human being. And then I went in on my first my first retreat. There were some great facilitators there. Uh, the setup was great. The food, it was very beautiful, very healthy, clean food. Um, and I got basically taken, I got taken to out to space on my first. Um, what was the experience? The experience I was, yeah, I was basically taken off to space i was basically flying around space looking at planets hang on go to the start talk <laughs> me through it I want to hear it. it's it's really hard to explain because unless you've done it or experienced that psychedelic experience which 
you know, I, I know you have, so not ayahuasca, though. but ayahuasca is very different. It is hard to explain. Ayahuasca's, it's hard to explain without sounding like a lunatic. Yeah, a little bit, you know, but ayahuasca's like ayahuasca, the vine of ayahuasca is like it's a purgatory. So it's idea is, is it's a cleanse, it's a detox. But what they do with ayahuasca, they mix it with shakruna and and shakruna has got uh, DMT in it, dimethyltryptamine which is what gives you the hallucin, you know, that's what makes you hallucinate and it gives you the psychedelic aspect. The ayahuasca vine in some traditions can be taken on its own. It doesn't have so a, it's not hallucinogenic. It's not hallucinogenic. No, it's got that. an MAI, MAI inhibitor in it, which helps the shakruna work. They work together, you know, and again, when you look at the tradition of where it was found, it was, it was created, well, people were shown ayahuasca and shakruna and how to mix it in a, in a dieta by a plant that they were doing a dieta on so when you look at where it was found in the amazon they were like miles away from each other hang on, <laughs> hang on. so when you do a dieta you back get back. visions yes. in your dreams and these visions so if you're doing a dieta on a certain plant this plant will come to you in your dreams and it will come to you in visions and what happened they so the 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 story is is when they found ayahuasca and shakruna and put it together they were dieting on a plant it might have been bob and sanya i'm not sure what the plant was there's so many, there's there's literally thousands but they were doing a dieta and in a tribesman or a tribeswoman's in their visit in their visions in their dreams they were told about ayahuasca vine and told about shakruna because shakruna is not the only they were told about that in their visions but these, on the dieta. These plants are thousands of miles away from well, each other. Yeah, hundreds of miles away well, from each other. The, they're in the Amazon. What they did would win a a Nobel Prize if in the Western world. You know the way they concocted that, and it was is and, unbelievable. And so it was like the chance of them happened to stumble on these yeah, two plants. It's in just no chance. It's like impossible. No, impossible. Even if they did trial and error, it just wouldn't happen. You know. So oh my god. And there's some great science behind it. But yeah, they came to them in their visions in their dietas. Um, so this is where we're getting a lot of information from plants. We get a lot of knowledge from plants if you diet on them correctly. You know, at the end of the day, people eat plants every day, so they, they help us live. So we just lost the connection with the Western world. But yeah, so again, I went off on one a little bit then, but my first, my first experience with ayahuasca was, it was pretty beautiful, actually. I got like a massive vision of like I was going down a tunnel people get it when they smoke DMT I was like blasted off and there was a lot of bright colors and then the next thing you know it was like I was in space and I was like flying around planets and our planet at the moment I think this is what it was teaching me was the planet earth is alive it's going well but there are the other planets in our solar system are not alive at the moment they're dead but they'll come round. So the Earth's going to die at some point, and then it might be Jupiter or another planet might create life, and then that will be the next planet. I don't know. Like I said, it's, it sounds a bit crazy. <laughs> but what it was showing me is that, you know, although things die, things regenerate. Things can come back. That's the message. Yeah. So that was the message I was getting of it. And what it, what it did is it set me up for the rest of the week for my own healing, because on the next session... What it did was it I was floating in space and the ayahuasca was examining my body and seeing what was wrong with my body physically, mentally and spiritually. And it was very gentle, it was very loving and it was giving me like a diagnostic <coughs> of what was wrong. So then on the third ceremony, it knew what was wrong with me. It knew I had some trauma. Um, and it knew I had some energy blockages. So I was blocked up in my body. There was a few physical things which it can only do so much. Um, but what it did is it made me, my brother basically came to me in my, in my visions. So my brother was there and then I got to speak to my brother about things that I'd never spoke to him about. I, I talked to him, I asked him things. Um, and then it also showed me that, you know, like when we die, our conscious can still carry on. So the things that we don't deal with on this planet mentally, 
and that could be some trauma, that could be something that's happened in your life, you'll take that somewhere in, in the next stage and you'll have to deal with that in the next stage. And then when once that's dealt with, you'll be able to move on. So, so why not deal with it now? Kind of thing. Deal with it now. Yeah. That's my view on it now. Is deal, deal get it now. get it dealt with now because if you don't, you're still going to have to deal with it. And I think that it might mix in with karma. If you've done something bad to someone, you think when you die, that's going to be it. It's, it's probably not. And this is just my belief. I'm not saying this is true, but the idea of them showing me the planets and how planets will die but then regenerate was the same as my spirit will die in this material world. And if we don't go on to a higher plane, we'll probably come back to this material world and live again and have to deal with what we didn't deal with in our other lives. Like I said, this is just my... Yeah, no, but taking away the... I mean, taking take, taking away the... Your conscious carries on and you have to deal with that stuff later on after you're dead. That, like, for the sceptics, taking that bit away. Why would you want to be on your deathbed with something you haven't dealt with? Something hanging over you. Exactly. That you know it's there. You know it's there now. Yeah. Why? Why deal with it? Yeah. Just nail it. Get it. Get it sword. Heal what? it. It just festers away. Yeah. Otherwise. You heal it. You heal. You heal it. That's that's my view on it. You know, and that's that's my experience. So you know, like you might say I'm right or wrong, but that's my that's my experience, and you can't really take my experience away from me. And my belief system now, it's made me a better person. So now that I, like I said, in that in that ceremony, I dealt, I'm, I, I, I felt I was with my brother. I, and it was funny because the sh one of the shamans, the, the female, uh, Marcella, her name was, she came over to me at the time and she sang me in Nakaru. And I had this blockage in me. What's the Nakaru? Nakaru is the songs they sing. So they will kind of, because of the ayahuasca, like the plant medicines talks to them. So it tells them what's wrong with you. So what they'll do is they'll sing a certain akaru that will clear blockages in you. So the akarus will, will do different things. And the akaru, she's obviously seen something wrong with me and she sang this akaru to me. And at the end of the akaru, she's usually they'll, they'll, they'll blow like, they'll blow some water onto it. It's like a vampire juice, I think they call it. Agua diente, I think, uh, and then they'll bless you and they'll move on. And she'd done that the last two on the first two ceremonies, but on this ceremony, she must have seen something was blocked. And she grabbed my head, and she pulled my head forward, and she she'd sucked something from the crown of my head, and then she wiped something on my face, wiped my other side of my face, wiped my hands, and then I cried like a baby for probably two hours i cried until i couldn't cry anymore and i was releasing a lot of trauma i was releasing the trauma i'd had from my brother that i'd buried um and other things that happen in your life you know people have been through some crazy things you know but it felt like i'd released it um and it was a very beautiful thing when i look back at that now it really cleansed me. I still had work to do because we've still got work to do. It's n there's no magic pills. You know, ayahuasca is not a magic drug. You know, you're not, you've got to still, or a magic plant medicine. I don't like calling it a drug. You've still got to put the work in. So after my ceremony there, I had another ceremony the next day, which I purged. It was only the, f it was the first time I purged that week. Um, so I'd done a lot of releasing physically, mentally, and spiritually. And then since that day, all I've done is I've just built on that, you know, and I'm, I'm, my lifestyle is quite a healthy lifestyle. You know, people say, because I don't drink and stuff, it can be boring and, you know, whatever. I, I like to go and sit in the jungle and take ayahuasca if, if, if need be. <laughs> it's, it's not very, that's not boring. <laughs> trust, tr trust me. Yeah, whereas drinking every week and singing the same songs and talking the same show is, you know, people do it for forever for 30 years it's, it's boring i'm afraid I, I probably won't get much credit for that but <coughs> i don't judge that either you know people have to do what they want to do they're living the lives that they want to live you know I, i've got i don't judge anyone i've got compassion for everyone we're all where i was supposed to be so yeah so since then 
I realised I wanted to dive deeper, so I ended up going to Peru last year and doing a dieta. Um, I was in Peru for four months, and that's when I worked at a retreat centre with um, Heroic Hearts Project USA, who were sending ex-veterans over with depression, PTS, and we were using ayahuasca. I was just a facilitator. I was just cleaning sick buckets and making sure everyone was all right. Occasionally putting people in cold showers, which is a another experience. Well, because they purged. Because they're purged, or because they're struggling. You know, the medicine's strong, and they they're really struggling. So you put them in in a cold water to bring them down a little bit. It doesn't always work, but um, you can imagine some soldiers, some of the stuff they've been they've gone through. You know, it's unbelievable. You know, and and to be part of that, I feel very blessed. You know, because some of them guys, I was speaking to one the other day. I've tried to stay in touch with a lot of these these people. Some of them people have have have, have healed themselves. They're still working on themselves, and there's still work to do. We're all still works in progress. You know, but it's great to see just that change, just the look. People look younger. You know, after one week, it's like they look 10 years younger because they've offloaded, they've released, and they've released a lot of not just physical stuff, but spiritual and, and mental stuff. Then blockages are deep, you know, and some of the things you hear about these ex-veterans, I I feel very privileged to have been part of, you know, quite a lot of ceremonies, you know, quite a lot of people. And my view on it is I wanted to, I wanted to get healed and heal myself so then I could maybe help someone else, you know, and I spent a lot of time trying to help other people, but I wasn't really healed, so I wasn't really giving me, it was more probably about me, you know, so now I feel I'm in a better place, and, and no doubt, you know, I've got I've got a beautiful family, there's going to be times where I'm going to be low again, you know, I'm, there's going to be times where I'm going to have trauma, you know, but I think I know how to deal with it. There, the there are ways of dealing with it. You know, it's not, there are loads of problems. We've got to concentrate on solutions. And plant medicine's not for everyone. You know, going to the jungle and taking plant medicine is not going to be for everyone. I want to find things that are accessible to everyone. That's why I love the Wim Hof method, because anybody can do that. You know, and there are other ways, there are other <coughs> practices. You know, I think ayahuasca works well for veterans because, you know, the. Unless you've got friends who've served and who've spoken to you about some of the things that they've had to go through, it's very hard to resonate and to relate with that. You know, and, and they've gave up, you know, servicemen, whatever service you're in, they've gave up so much, supposedly, for their country. <coughs> And these people are the, are the people who need to be looked after now, you know. And, and I'm quite passionate about that. And again, I was I was I was given a very good opportunity to go and work with these people. And there's some beautiful people there, you know. But some of these people are stuck. They're struggling, you know. They've lost their identification. Their or, ident or their identity. Or their identity is. The, the problem. The problem. That's the big, they became, I spoke about it earlier, my story, my narrative was my brother had died, I'd found my brother, you know, and I tried to resuscitate him, you know, and if you talk to some of these servicemen, they've been walking along in Iraq and their best fl best friends had their head blown off in front of them, you know, and, and, and they're having to deal with that, you know, and, and you know, I don't want to be too controversial, but the way the American soldiers are looked after by their country compared to the way the British soldiers are looked after by their country is, is disgusting. The British soldiers are not looked after at all. And just because materially the Americans help their soldiers out <coughs> doesn't mean that psychologically they're going to be helped out, but their government helps their soldiers out much more than the British government. The British government needs to do something about this. And this is just an outsider, I've never served, who, that's, this is just my opinion, but this is from working with vet, with veterans and talking to them about how they get looked after, how they get helped in America compared to how they get helped in the UK. And the, the difference is massive.
But America, you know, they're, they're 10 years ahead on a lot of stuff. You know, like the Imperial College in London has got some of the greatest in the world, the best in the world. They know more about psychedelic therapy than anyone. You know, but not many people in the UK know about psychedelic therapy. So, you know, what's going on? Why, why, why aren't we helping the people, like ex-veterans, who really need the help? You know, and my passion now is to work with Heroic Hearts Project, <coughs> to be in, I'm, 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 I'm the integration coach now for Heroic Hearts Project, and I just want to maybe help someone. You know, I want to make people aware that there is treatments out there, you know, and that we can, you know, you can help yourself. You've got to help, want to help yourself first. You know, we need a bit of support for this as well. This is the key, mate. Uh, to your, yeah, to your point, this is the key. There's, there's two sides to it, I think, with people dealing with any any problem, physical or mental. It's like, it's one, you need to have, the, you need to have some sort of will there to do something about it. And two, you need to have the knowledge to be able to know where to go to do something about it or know exactly what to do about it. There's, there's two things, the, the two go hand in hand. There is <clears throat> there is absolutely an element of this where it, it, you you have to empower yourself to do something. Every single thing comes down to the decision you have to make. And the only circumstance that doesn't happen is where you are nearly fucking dead and someone else makes a decision for you. Yeah. You know, my, my, my dad's an example, he's an al he's a, he's an, he was an alcoholic, he's a recovering alcoholic now. He didn't make any decision. He made no decision. And he, he listens to this, so he watches this. So, you know, sorry, Dad, but he knows the score. He didn't make any decision. He didn't have the willpower to do it. He couldn't do it. He was too far gone down that alcoholism journey. He was fucked. He was fucked. And he, he nearly died because of alcoholism. He ended up going to the hospital, didn't put himself in there. He was taken there, you know, in a fucking ambulance. And the decision was made for him, you know, and he ended up basically doing a few weeks cold turkey in the hospital while he was trying to survive. And, and, and so the, only in that extremist, don't get to that point. Everything else apart from that, literally, you're going to die. You're incapacitated and unconscious. Everything else other than that takes a decision on your part. Yeah. I'm going to, today I'm going to, when someone says, when I work at the work and someone says, how are you? I'm going to say, yeah, I'm right, but I've been feeling a sh bit shit for the last few weeks because you've been feeling a shit shit or months. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what it is. I'm going to be honest about it. Or I'm going to, I'm going to these 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 well-being and mindfulness things I keep hearing about. I've heard Wim Hof mention a few times breathing. That says he. Yeah, I think I'll try that. I've heard about yoga being done. I think I'll try that. Or I've heard about meditation being done. I think I'll try that. Or I've heard about heroic hearts UK. I've heard about ayahuasca. I think I'll look more into that. I'll see about going about accessing that. It's that knowledge piece. You're absolutely right, mate. What are you doing, like with? The, the podcast today, you talk about your own experiences and you talk about the tools that are out there and all the tools aren't for everyone. Yeah. Like definitely. Wim Hof, I've tried the Wim Hof thing. I found a benefit from it. I didn't keep going back to it. I don't do it. I, it just doesn't work for me. For what if it, when I say it doesn't work, it's not something that's drawing me to it. But there's other things I do do. I do meditation in other ways and the physical activity, other, other things. But the point is, well, where Wim Hof, I tried it and I found other stuff. There's a whole two blocks out there of stuff from plant medicines to your pharmaceutical medicines, if needs be, in, in certain situations to just, just loads of stuff. It's, mm -hmm. it's knowledge, it's yeah. knowledge, but you've got to do something about yourself, <coughs> you know. You know, it's uh, it's it's I think what you've right, said mate. there is for me is is probably the most important thing that I've learned. You were saying earlier what you know, what makes you angry and things like that. The oh, on the icebreaker. Yeah, on the icebreaker, icebreaker questions, yeah. you know. But the reason why I don't get that kind of anger is because the one thing I've learned in this life is that I take responsibility for myself. And it's easy to blame people. It's easy to say it's their fault. It's easy to say it's the government. It's easy to say it's the politicians. Look at yourself. Take responsibility for yourself as a human. Because if you start really looking at yourself and taking responsibility for yourself, you'll have no one else to blame. You know, we want to change the world. Change yourself, you'll change the world. You know, and this for me goes, start with your diet, what you're putting in your body. You know, because let alone alcohol and, and drugs and everything else, you know, if we've got trauma, we want to escape that trauma, you know, a bottle of vodka can be pretty beneficial, especially when we're feeling raw and we need to get, we need to, 
stop thinking about what's gone on in our life, that bottle of vodka's got its benefits. But then benefits will only last for so long before they start becoming detriment to your life. So there are healthy ways of, you know, having a healthy escapisms, I call them. You know, for me, the Wim Hof method worked. But don't do it three times and think, oh, that doesn't work for me. Do it for six months. And I'll, I'm guarantee you, like you say, Hugh, you're right, it might not work for everyone, but give something a bit of a chance. You know, don't just try one thing, try a few things. You know, because there's a lot of problems out there, but what are you doing about it? You know, there's a song by Paul Simon, he says, breakdowns come and breakdowns go. What are you going to do about it? That's what I'd like to know. <laughs> you know, and it is, it's taking responsible responsibility and, and that can go back. So for me, I can't get angry with someone else because I'm in a rush because I've been late and then someone cuts me up in the car and I want to get out of the car and kill them. That's my fault for being late. Yeah, so, you know, we stress ourselves out and that's why stress is such a killer. You know, but people don't take responsibility for themselves. It's easy to blame. My friend Tony Summers says, when you're pointing at someone else, you've got three fingers pointing back at yourself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So stop yeah. stop blaming other people yeah. and take responsibility for yourself. And and take responsibility for, you know, your loved ones, for your kids. If you're gonna have kids, take responsibility for them. You know, because while they while they're kids, they need you. They need that help. A lot of stuff happens from when we're brought up from childhood. And even me as a parent, you know, it was one of my goals to be to try and be a good parent. You'll have to ask my boys if I've been a good parent or not, because I, I can't say. But it's a, such a responsibility, because while you're children, you know, you need looking after. You need someone to love you unconditionally. Some of the things that happen as kids is traumatic. You know, like I said, with my, 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 my martial arts instructor, Jeff Thompson, he got abused by his martial arts instructor. You know, and you go, wow. You know, but he came out, he wrote books about it, he wrote plays about it, you know, he I call it writing therapy. He got it out, he got healed by writing it down. And you know, and even just doing that, if you've had something happen in your life that's that's left an effect on you, get a journal out, write it down. I wrote I wrote it down about my motorbike accident. And for ages I didn't wanna <coughs> I didn't want to accept the fact that it was my fault. And it was my fault. It was my responsibility. You know, I'm a self-defence instructor and I'm driving around on a motorbike. It's not good self-defence. So, but by writing that down in a journal, I don't even think I've ever showed it to anyone. I wrote it down and it released it. It put it back out into the air, you know, and something I did with my brother, which was only last year, uh, when I was in Peru, I wrote a letter to my brother and again, I said things that I hadn't spoke to anyone about. There's things that I know with my brother that no nobody knows about. Um, and I wrote them all down there, and then I did a fire ceremony. So I put that letter into the fire, and I gave it back to the universe. You know, and again, that's something to do. You might have had something that's happened to you. Write it down. You know, if you've been serving in Iraq or Afghan or whatever, and something's happened, write it down. Create a fire, a little fire. Be careful when you're creating fires. <laughs> and put it in the fire. Give it back to the universe. Release it. That's what we don't do, is we don't release the things that happen to us. That's why talking's good, but talking therapy is not for everyone. People go to counsellors and they they lie. You know, they talk bullshit or they just say what needs to be said. It don't work for everyone. You know, so just just find something that will work for you. There's Like you said, there's loads of practices out there. You know, get in touch with me. Yeah. How do people get in touch know. with you? People get in touch with me. It's really, I'm, I'm, I'm on Facebook very, very rarely. Oh, fuck Facebook. So I don't, I, don't, <laughs> I don't use social media. Do you know what I mean? But get, get in touch with me for a Heroic Hearts Project UK. Uh, what's the website? Uh, it's Heroic, Heart, it's Heroic, Heroic Hearts, Hearts UK, isn't it? UK, yeah. So, you know, get in touch with me for that. I might not get in touch, get straight back to you, but... Um, just looking at the website. I will, Sorry. I will. I'm prepared to to, to lend a hand. Heroic Heart 
Heroics UK, Heroic. one second. The website, we should have known this already. I've said it a bunch of times before. HeroicHeartsUK.com. Heroic Heroic there we go, yeah. 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 So, Perfect. You know, but yeah, um, like I said, I feel like I've put myself in a good position to feel healed. And now I just want to be of service to others. Well, sounds like you are, mate. It's been an absolute Thank pleasure. You. Cheers for coming in and talking about it. Thank you. And uh, I'll do it again. I'll do it again. Yeah, definitely. I feel like there's a lot we haven't covered. <laughs> it probably is, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for listening as well. So, yeah. Right. Cheers, good, good luck. Great. Thank you. That's it. Thank you for watching Hey Chower. If you enjoyed this episode, why not become a Hey Chower patron? Hey Chower patrons get exclusive access to premium content with guests like the one you just watched. There are private interviews with previous guests and with this guest that nobody will see except for the Hey Chower patrons. So before this podcast was recorded, I recorded an exclusive Q&A, a shorter interview structured around eight questions. All the questions were chosen by patrons beforehand, and that interview is online now for patrons. That happens every time. Patrons also get access to all of the episodes before anyone else. They get advanced viewing of the episodes. And you also get other perks and bonuses. All of the information is on charliecharlie1.com. Just hit the menu item, become a patron. It'll show you everything there, including access to the H-Hour Discord community and private patron-only channels on there. So go to charliecharlie1.com and hit the menu item, become a patron. Easy peasy. If you prefer to listen to your podcast normally, H-Hour is also on Spotify, it's on Apple Podcasts, it's on Google Podcasts, it's on all of the podcast apps. And if you don't even want to bother with a podcast app, you can go to the the H-Hour website, charliechannel1.com, and you can actually play the podcast, video or audio, directly through the website, through your browser. Simples. Thank you for watching. Thank you for being a supporter. Like the video, subscribe to the channel, and I will catch you on the next episode. Thank you.